Hello and welcome. My name is Cynthia Reddick. I am a registered dietitian and certified nutrition support clinician, and I am excited to present to you today comfort and care of your feeding tube. This is one of my favorite subjects to talk about, so I would like to thank the Oli Foundation for inviting me to present a subject that I'm so passionate about. I, if any of you have, you know, watched my presentations in the past, you know that I generally come with plenty of pictures. So pull up your chair and have a seat and get ready to learn a few things about your feeding tube. We are going to be covering quite a bit of ground in a very short period of time, but I would like to start the presentation with introducing you to a, a great picture of Sacramento, California, which is where I live. This is the Tower Bridge, which is in the downtown area, very close to where I live. So that is how we will begin our picture illustration of our presentation today. My disclosures are I am employed as the National Tube Feeding Manager at Quorum CVS Specialty Infusion. A non-financial relationship I have to disclose is that I work with the Oli New Connectors Working Group as well as an active member of the GEDSA Clinical Advisory Board. Our objectives today is we're going to talk about feeding tubes. Um, I would like to say that tube feeding tolerance is not all about formula, so we'll get into that. And generally I talk about resolving or strategies to resolve tube site complications, but I'm going to change it up a little bit this time. And I'm going to go a little bit more root cause on you today. And I think that, you know, it's great to be able to solve the problem and, and resolve painful tube sites and things of that nature, but really it's important to get to the root cause and I don't spend enough time on this subject. So I figured I would dedicate this time to that. And it's in the details, and there's two details that tend to crop up the most often, so that's what I'm going to focus on in our time today, around balloon fill volume for balloon gastrostomy tubes, whether it's a low-profile device or a dangler-style tube. Balloon fill volume has an impact, as well as external bolster placement. So if you don't have a low-profile device and you do have a dangler-style tube, you very likely have an external bolster. Um, that you need to pay attention to. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll wrap it up with John's story. And I come from a place of ex presenting, I love to present experiential data. And I feel like my presentations are presentations of data with a soul. And I'm um, stealing that from Brene Brown, who does something similar but very different. And um, John's story illustrates several things that I think are, are fairly compelling. So um, I'll use his story and his journey to educate you on a few things. So let's begin. We know that home enteral nutrition monitoring in a classic sense from a clinical perspective and as a dietitian when I worked in the hospital setting and even in home care, we're looking at tube feeding formula tolerance. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, abdominal discomfort, those types of things. But what I found to be neglected in the home care space, because we have a longer relationship with, with people who are tube feeding, what gets neglected is tube related issues. And there's a lack of knowledge around how to address these issues. And so that's a bit of a concern because if you're at home on tube feeding, you may or may not have a tribe of experts around you that know how to help resolve those issues. And, and sometimes we find that our, our patients are told that things are normal and to just not really do anything about it um, when that's not the case. And so I think that surrounding, if you have a feeding tube, surrounding yourself with a tribe of clinicians that have a little bit of experience and some expertise in how to manage and maybe help you resolve some of those issues will get you to a place in your journey with a feeding tube that brings you into a great relationship with your feeding tube. If you've got a lot of complications, sometimes that it's not that way. And, and I'm passionate about it because I, I feel like sometimes it's just simple strategies that can help somebody resolve some painful yet fairly straightforward issues, but they just get overlooked or, or told that, that these problems are normal. So I want to review what I usually talk about, I'm going to do it very quickly, which are two of the main 
complications that I see in the home setting that we are troubleshooting uh, with our long-term patients and helping folks get some strategies together to help resolve the complications that come. So I'll give you a couple of examples of those. And the first one that I see most common is hypergranulation. And so what that looks like is illustrated here. This is an, a great example of hypergranulation. This is proud flesh sometimes referred to. And it's just a, it's a growth of tissue that really shouldn't be there. And, and it grows there for a variety of different reasons. Uh, usually it's irritation at the stomacite from too much movement or maybe using um, an abrasive chemical like um, hydrogen peroxide to clean or too much um, uh, sort of flopping around of a tube, things of that nature will, will lead to hypergranulation, but it can be resolved. And so with some simple strategies, you can resolve it in, in some cases in the matter of a couple of weeks. So this is an example of what it can look like with the proper strategy. And there's a whole presentation on the OLE website where I spend an hour going over all the details of these complications. So I won't do that here um, in the strategies to resolve them because that is in a repository on the OLE website. Um, but I do want to just kind of recap what I see the most often and, and then some simple strategies to, to prevent it and get to the root cause. So the second thing after hypergranulation is yeast infection. That's the most common infection that I see at the tube site. And this is a classic presentation with red irritated skin and some satellite lesions and very painful tube site. And that usually occurs because there's leaking occurring at the stoma site. And that leaking is because of uh, one of several reasons, which I'll, I'll cover here in our time together. But with some simple strategies, you can resolve the yeast infection and have a better experience with that feeding tube and a, very, a better experience on tube feeding in general. So those are some common complications. And, you know, I want to go over some basics of tubes to get to the root cause of what might cause some of these things. So let's pause for a moment and look at the anatomy of the G-tube placement. This example that I'm showing here is a balloon gastrostomy tube. So the picture on the left is a dangler style G-tube. I have one here. So this is a dangler style G-tube, right? And it's sort of one size fits all as it relates to the sizing of it because that bolster is adjustable. And that's an important detail. So when you're looking at this tube placement, you can see this external bolster in relationship to the internal bolster has to be set properly so that it fits well and that balloon needs to be inflated properly as well. Sometimes there's a balloon on the inside and sometimes there's an internal bolster, um, but in, so, and they act in, in a similar way. So what you're looking at is a balloon internal retention device that sits up on the inside lining of the stomach. So that's what you see here. And then this is an external bolster that sits on the outside of the stomach. And so that's on the skin. And it's a bit of an art and a science to make sure that that's set properly. So it's not too tight, but you want it tight enough. It's not, I shouldn't say tight. You want it fitted well enough so that you don't have a lot of play and movement in here with this tube in the stoma tract. So you want the balloon resting here on the stomach lining. You want the bolster resting with a little bit of airflow on the, on the skin of the stomach or um, other parts of the abdomen if it's not in your stomach and you have a feeding tube in your jejunum, it's really kind of the same concept. But that's important to note, this is what it looks like, kind of what you can't see is, is illustrated here. And then the picture on the right, we're looking at a low profile device with the port cap open, you can see, and then really the important thing to see here is that this is a nicely fitting low profile device, right? So this stoma shaft on this button is fitted appropriately to the size of this patient's needs. With Again, with the balloon inflated nicely and um, there's not a lot of movement. So you can't see this tube. You can't imagine this tube sort of flopping around, moving around too much play. It's not gonna come in and out and in and out and that movement, which sometimes leads to hypergranulation. The other thing that I wanna point out is when you look at the balloon, this is, and we'll talk about balloon inflation. When you look at the balloon, it, it's acting as sort of a, and this balloon is filled with water. So let me state that up front. But this balloon, when it's set properly, is acting as a 
pseudo seal. So sort of a, a seal to the stoma tract so that if you have a reservoir filled with liquid, so your stomach has formula or water or it, you know, whatever other liquids go through your feeding tube, if there's any that sort of come up into this area because you're laying down or just because of positioning or because you've filled yourself very full, sometimes people will feed a large volume all at once. So if that balloon is sitting nicely and inflated properly, it'll prevent things from leaking out. If that balloon is either underinflated or if that bolster is, say, set up, set up here on the tube, and what you see on the outside is a what appears to be a tube that's fitting nicely on the outside, but you have all this play. And let's say this tube is pushed down here too far, then you're going to allow liquids to sort of leak out. So that's sort of the structure and, and what it looks like on the inside from an artist's rendition. I love this picture because it shows an illustration of um, what how the balloon shape changes when you have different amounts of liquid in there. So in this case, it's a difference between four milliliters of water and five milliliters of water inside this balloon. It completely changes the shape. So you can see how with this balloon, it would act nicely as that, I'll call it a pseudo seal. It's not a perfect seal, but it, it blocks some of the liquid that might come through that stoma tract where this is not going to do that. You're going to see leaking. So it might be sized properly, but if the balloon is underinflated, well then, you, you could have some leaking. So I was working with somebody last week, actually, who was having a lot of leaking at her tube site, and she's an experienced tube feeder. She changes out her own buttons. So I had her do some experiments with her, I, I won't call it an experiment. I had her check her balloon fill volume because it's something I knew she could do. And so what I had her do with her balloon, with her button in place, so here's an example of the type of button she had. With her button in place, I had her tape it down to her abdomen so that when she deflated the balloon, it wouldn't fall out. So that's a good practice. And then I had her put um, her syringe. This is a slip tip syringe, and it comes in the kit that arrives with her with her backup buttons that she keeps. And you can see that there's measurements on here, so it acts as a syringe and also a measuring device, right? And so, if so, what I had her do was insert her um, slip tip syringe into the, the balloon port. And again, this is because she knew how to do it and then withdraw the liquid that was in there completely. So you can feel when it's empty because the, the plunger stops moving. So, and you can measure how much fluid is in there. And every button is different in terms of how much liquid, how much water should be in there. So some buttons will have a range of 7 to 10 milliliters. Some buttons will have a target amount, 5 milliliters or 7 milliliters. It just depends on the tube size, the brand. They're, they all sort of adjust based on the size of that, of that button. So when I had her measure that, her measurement, she only measured 3 milliliters in her button that was supposed to have 8. So what she did, because she had two different brands of buttons in the home, she also inflated her, her alternate button. So what you're looking at here is a, is a Mickey and a Mini 1. So the Mickey and the Mini um, is what you're looking at here sort of side by side. And this was something that she was able to do at home with her own supplies. And then um, I, I asked her to do this so she could see the difference. I wanted to illustrate for her why her tube was leaking. And so when she looked at a button that was filled with three milliliters versus eight milliliters, sort of all the, you know, the awareness was there. She understood what was going on. So she um, agreed to check on her balloon volume once a week or so, uh, just to kind of check in on that, or if she was experiencing issues. Now, I'm not a, recommending that all people with balloon tubes check their volumes um, unless they've been trained how to do it. And so that's something that you would do with your physician or with your GI clinic or with a nurse who comes to the home potentially. How, however and whenever you get educated on how to do this is fine as long as you have competence and, and you know how to do it so that you don't um, cause any further problems without really knowing what you're doing. The first time you do it, it can be a little scary, but once you get the hang of it, it's, uh, it's pretty simple. 
so that's a great illustration just sort of showing you. The other thing this, these pictures show is that, you know, the same size buttons with different brands are not exactly the same. They're not going to fit the same, and they're not going to fit the same because the balloon shapes are different, and it's going to it's going to shorten the shaft of like, for instance, this balloon sort of rises up a little higher on the shaft, so it's going to fit a little bit differently than, say, this one that doesn't rise so high on the shaft. So when you're comparing different brands of tubes, the same measurements are not always a guarantee of an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. So if you're going to change sizes, you would want to measure with that manufacturer's stoma measuring device or, or get measured by your healthcare provider. Okay, so those are the balloon gastrostomy tubes. I think we've covered that well. The next thing I want to cover is this external bolster because this is an important detail when you have a dangler style tube. Uh, I refer to these as dangler style tubes now. I learned that term from an Ole consumer a few years back at an Ole conference and it sort of stuck with me. I like using words with images. So her dangler style tube, this is a GJ tube actually. So um, she has a single access Stoma, but she has access to both her stomach and her jejunum with this tube. So this is what the tube looks like normally. It's set nicely there, but she was complaining of some leaking later in the day, and so occasionally what would happen is it would sort of adjust, and it wasn't necessarily because she was moving around a lot. She wasn't moving this bolster herself. What was happening was the jejunal portion of her tube was sort of getting pulled, <laughs> was getting pulled down in her intestine in a way, like with the normal movement of the intestine was sort of pulling on it. And what that was doing was pulling the bolster up a little bit. So it was just this subtle thing that happened to her. I'd never, you know, seen this happen before or heard about this happening before, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. So. What we went about doing was trying to educate her on paying attention to how and where the bolster was set on her own tube. So the question I had was, when the tube is set here, what is the measurement on the tube versus when the bolster is set back here? So we can see the difference and what that looks like. So this was a great, another vantage point, different picture that was sent. And this was really clear. So when she took a second look at it, when it was set properly, it was set at four centimeters. And then after this, this pulling and movement of the bolster, it would move out to about a six on her tube. So what was happening is, if you can imagine, remembering that that internal balloon is now, um, I'll just go ahead and inflate and illustrate. So although her, her bolster on the outside might have looked like it was sitting flush or even if it was sitting away a little bit from the abdomen, what's happening on the inside is if that balloon is not resting against the inside lining of the stomach and it's sitting up like this, this is where you can get the leakage. And so that's what was occurring. So she had to figure out a way to stabilize that bolster so it wouldn't slide so easily. So sometimes when tubes get a little bit older, they start moving easier and it, when they're brand new, they are hard to move, but as they are in place longer, they're easier to move, but you don't wanna replace a whole tube just because that bolster maybe is moving. So what we recommended is that she figure out a way to secure this bolster and tighten it up around this little section, which has this little this little ledge basically that goes up along the tube. You don't want to you don't want to squeeze anything along the tube, but if you have a securement device that sort of squeezes on this portion, which is this little portion here, it's part of the bolster. It's actually not part of the tube. It'll help keep that bolster set in place. So we gave her some ideas. This was one of them. This is um, a clamp, like a nylon. Um, twisting cable clamps, and you can find these online. Some tubes actually come with them to kind of help secure. I've seen people use zip ties. I'm not a big fan of that because they can be hard to get off, but um, some people will maybe tape it down or put some tape on the actual tube so that the bolster can't slide past the tape. There's a lot of different ways that you can approach that. Okay, so we've covered 
two main root causes. So the, the balloon fill volume and securing that bolster appropriately and making sure that if you have a bolster style tube or a dangler that when, you know, just looking at the, at the tube on the surface, the skin may not be enough. You need to make sure that the, that the internal retention device is actually resting up against the stomach lining on the inside. And then you set the external bolster and so that you know you have a good fit, okay? So that's really key. And those two things will resolve, in my opinion, more than half of the leaky tube issues that tend to plague some folks' um, G-tube sites or J-tube sites. So let's talk about John's journey. So he had an interesting journey, and there's, there's a couple elements to his story that I think are so interesting and educational. So he, he was having some leaky tube issues, and it turns out that the, those leaky tube issues were sort of new for him, even though he hadn't changed his regimen for five years. He'd been doing the same thing without any problems, and then all of a sudden, he was having this leaking, and he was developing, you know, sort of some growth here. There was, it just wasn't getting cleaned very well, and it was leaky. It was painful. He had a, a yeast infection going on at the tube site because of all the moisture that was going on. It would bleed because of some hypergranulation that was there. He had a lot of cleaning to do on that tube, so we went over how to get that clean and how to do that a little more often. Um, he said, the tube is bothering me, and he just wants to be normal again. He was at his wit's end, basically, and found his way to me. And so we were able to come up with a strategy. And so what I learned after talking to him was the root cause of his leaking had nothing to do with his tube. Even after the doctor replaced the tube, the doctor put in a tube that was a bigger French size even, and it still didn't resolve the issue. But just after talking to him very briefly, I figured out he was feeding too fast and he was feeding too much too fast. He was feeding about a liter and a half of formula and water within about three minutes, four minutes. And he just is an efficient guy. He's an engineer. He's an efficient guy. Doesn't want to spend a whole lot of time doing this feeding and flushing and all of that. And he refers to it as high altitude feeding. And uh, you want to get in get it done and get out. And so that's kind of how we approach his tube feeding. But we went through a negotiation phase where we, you know, I sort of educated him on the size of his reservoir, which is his stomach, right, and how much he was actually feeding and that it was a negotiation to figure out, you know, what will fit his lifestyle in terms of how long does it take to feed versus, you know, the outcome, which is him being able to tolerate the amount of um, feedings that he was giving himself all at one time. And so once we sort of made the feeding smaller and spread things out a little bit, spread the flushing out a little bit, it was a game changer. But I identified something else that he needed. So um, we looked at the stoma site. This was a good close-up look at his hypergranulation. That's what you see here is this proud flesh because a lot of exposure to moisture was causing that hypergranulation. But I, getting to know him and learning his lifestyle, I realized this dangler style tube is not a good fit for his life. He's got hobbies and he does woodworking and he rebuilds classic cars. He has a shop and he's using tools and saws and things that make sparks, <laughs> things that you don't want around a dangler style tube. And so, and he would go, um, uh, surfing and, you know, didn't want this, have to deal with this thing sort of on a surfboard and laying on his stomach. So these were all things that I took into consideration and recommended that he actually get sized and um, have his tube replaced for a low profile device. It's not very common for adults to go straight to, bu to button style tubes or low profile devices and a lot of physicians don't think about it for adults. And so I worked with him and his physician to get him sized and they, um, he replaced the tube for him in his office, and then we went about the strategy to resolve his tube site issues, and we got them all fixed up, so that looks really good and healthy. It's been a game changer. So this is John and his wife, Wendy, and they're lovely. This is one of his classic cars that he rebuilt, and um, they're driving around Napa, California, not too far from where I live, and just he enjoys life. So he sent me this email after everything was said and done. And he says, I love not having to deal with my dangler. Things are better without a dangler. So he doesn't have to worry about tucking the tube into his clothes. 
He doesn't have to worry about catching it in his towel when he's drying off, or he doesn't have the weight of that dangler style tube pulling. He doesn't have to think about it when he's working with his tools. It's just this whole different way of experiencing life with a feeding tube. And it's easier to clean and he just feels like, you know, he doesn't have a tube anymore. It's not sort of so pronounced in his life because he's not having to navigate around it all the time. So it was a good fit for him. Something that I want you to think about if you're a clinician watching this or if you're a, a patient, a consumer who has a feeding tube that you're evaluating if, if a low profile device is a good fit for you. Um, think about John and the change for him. This is one of my standard slides. I started using this slide about every, in every presentation, I should say, for the last three or four years after going to an OLE conference and seeing one of our OLE ambassadors who is a passionate uh, tube feeder who is passionate about life and living a normal active life. And he showed up at the OLE conference with his new tattoo. And so this is, I think I can share who he is. I did it last year at the live meeting and got to introduce him to everybody. But this is Rick Davis, who is the epitome of somebody who has a terrific relationship with his feeding tube. The other reason I like this picture so much is because he has a very nicely fitting button. So you can see what that looks like. He's got a really healthy stoma site. And just a great relationship with this tube. He's got a great sense of humor as evidenced by his tattoo. So he does tell folks that um, hiking behind him may not be the best choice. So with that, I will finish the presentation with my other pretty picture. And so this is a picture from Bodega Bay that I uh, snapped about a year ago when I was at the coast. And I like wrapping up my presentation filled with pictures with um, something pretty from Northern California. So I would like to thank you all for attending Comfort and Care of Your Feeding Tube. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Thanks, everybody.